is The Wally Show, and uh, this is very exciting. Stop it. We have uh, Mike Donahue from 10th Avenue North with us, who, uh, in addition Hello. to musician and uh, weirdo, you can actually, uh, <laughs> for people that can't see this, he just reached out and grabbed my hand. Uh, for uh, he, he is a musician, and you can add author to his uh, title as well. Uh, lifelong dream, finding God's will for my life. No, you said oh, it. Oh, I said it backwards. Yeah, Sorry. that's the idea. I know. You keep messing me up. It's finding <laughs> God's life for my will, which I think is an interesting title, and it's all I've read so far. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but good news is I have a reading eye person, yes, and right. Becca reads for me and helps me with things, okay? Mm -hmm. So we're going to dive into this book. I like the turn of phrase. I think it's a good turn of phrase, finding God's life for my will. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Oh, well, I mean, as a musician— or I should say anyone, I think, who's on stage and is perceived by others as a level of success that they're trying to achieve, right? So whatever occupation that is. But I get a lot of people who come to me and because they see me on stage looking sort of successful in their mind, they go, how did you know this was God's will for your life? And I always look at them. I say, I don't. Yeah, because what if you messed up? What if he wanted you to be a baker and you ended up as a musician or like have a reputable job and you ended up as a musician? Yeah, well, we're all like, I need to know that this is what God wants me to do instead of going, am I doing what I'm doing the way God wants me to do it for the reasons that I should be doing it, right? Yeah. And, and the thing is, I believe if we are called to be people of faith, God can't give us all the answers, or we can't walk in faith. If you have all the answers, if you have all the plan, then you're not really walking in faith. You're just walking in certainty. So yeah. the, the question is not what's God's will for my life out there, but what's his life for my will in here? See, I have a 20-year-old. We're talking to Mike Donahue. I have a 20-year-old who, uh, you know, is trying to find her way in this world and stuff. And she's worrying about all these decisions she has to make. And what if I make the wrong decision and I'm not in God's will anymore? And I keep trying to tell her, if you are loving God and loving people and you're doing those two things really well, you're in his will. Like what you're doing is ancillary. Like that's, the, that's second, you know, tier. And he's going to course correct you and move you to where you need to be. But the, your focus needs to be on loving him and, and, and being good to other people, right? Right where you're at. I think that's what we miss. We're so looking for the other thing. We miss the moment that we're in. Well, sure. Absolutely. And that's why in Hebrews, it says over and over and over, it's, it's one of my favorite books of the Bible. It's like today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart today, today, as long as it's called today. And so I liken it to, we want God to type in our destination on GPS. And he wants to be that annoying friend He's like telling you the next turn just a mm. little too late. Yeah. Turn yes. right now. And you're like, no. <laughs> yeah. and, and you're going, God, just put it in the GPS so I know exactly what's yeah. going to happen. And he goes, if I did that, then you wouldn't listen to me anymore. But from a practical standpoint, I mean, we all come to places where we have forks in the road. What college courses am I going to take? What person am I going to marry? Like yeah. when those decisions come forward, I think we have this tendency to just kind of overstress about it because we're trying to find God's will, that one exact thing. So how do you approach those moments where you have things you have to choose between? The first chapter of my book is about trying to figure out if I should marry my wife. Oh, well then and, you, like, so there's a fork in the road. Yes. And then you can read one chapter and have all your questions answered. Well, no, I kind of, <laughs> that's I, fantastic. I kind of frustrate you because I, I say the Israelites, there's two moments where God calls the Israelites to go through a body of water. Okay. There's the Red Sea moment when the Pharaoh's army is chasing them down. And then it's when they're entering the promised land in the book of Joshua. With the Red Sea, Moses just you know, puts a staff down and the sea parts. Like go that way. Right. It's like, oh, okay. I didn't, God parted the water. This is obvious. With the, with the promised land, he, he uh, tells the priest to go in with the Ark of the Covenant. And I think it's like up to their shins or something, but they had to start walking into the water before it parted. And I just think we're all trying to figure that out. Is this one of those moments where God's going to part it and make it obvious? Or is mm -hmm. this like, and so for me with my wife, because some people say like, I got a word from the Lord. I knew it was going to happen. But for me, I had to just start asking, okay, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to marry this woman. 
But I was kind of dangling her along, like mm-hmm. stringing her along, going, what if someone else comes along? Yeah, like you're this great catch. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, like, right, exactly. Like I should have gone, this is my only yeah, chance. <laughs> right then. Right. Um, but I started going, okay, instead of worrying, is she the one? Let me just ask this question. How would I treat her if she was the one? Mm-hmm. And stringing her along while I'm weighing other options hardly seemed like the way I should be treating her. So I just started moving as if she was the one. And then I have to trust, like, if I haven't heard no, then keep walking and and trust that if God is involved, he'll divert you. That's a thing. I had a pastor one time when I was kind of curious about things and where they go and not sure about hearing God's voice in my life. And I was like in a, in a juxt a crossroad in my career. And, and he, he gave me simple advice. He's like, when I'm not sure of what I'm supposed to be doing, I just go to the last thing I, sh- I I'm sure that God told me to do. Absolutely. And I keep doing that, you know, yes. and I'm like, that makes total sense to me. Yes. Another way to look at it. Um, I don't tell this story in the book, but I was making smoothies for my daughters the other day. And, uh, it's the only way that they'll eat anything nutritious. You have to, you know, I'm the same way. (laughs) Put it in. This is a chocolate smoothie. And for five bucks, I won't tell her there's spinach in it. Yeah. So, and, uh, but now I, my parent, my kids know. (laughs) She's just ruined it. I know. I'm sorry. Daddy's been lying to me. Um, so I'm making the smoothie and my daughter comes down the stairs and my oldest daughter has this way of like looking like a girl out of a horror movie when she wakes up because she sneaks up on you. <laughs> She's standing on the landing and her hair is down. She's like Annabelle or she something. Says, hey, daddy. <laughs> oh, okay, what's going on? And uh, she goes, you making a smoothie? I said, yeah, you want to come help? She said, sure. At that moment, I don't realize I was forking some avocado into, because if you put some avocado in a smoothie, it makes it nice and creamy and it's mm. good saturated fats that okay. you don't realize is in there. Anyway, and, I'm, and I go, oh, and I drop the fork with the avocado into the Vitamix. Oh, and that thing's going at like a million miles an hour. So she comes and grabs a handful of spinach because my nine-year-old knows yeah. there's spinach in it, and she puts it in the fork, and I don't, I look down and I don't see the fork because the spinach is covered. <laughs> so we put more stuff, banana, <laughs> coconut milk, we're doing all stuff. When I hit go, like, you would have thought an earthquake was shaking the house. Lights are flickering, smoke, (laughs) sparks, and the fork shoots out the side of the Vitamix. Oh, that's powerful. Us through. It hit, it puts a hole in my wall, okay? I'm going, if that went this way, I would be dead. Right. And, I mean, I mean... Smoothie, you know, it just, it shot. I was clean. I was finding smoothie on the ceiling six months later, right? And I liken that to what's God's will for my life? What do I need to do? What do I need to accomplish? More, 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 more. What else? What else? What else? What else? And God's just going, hey, let's start with that fork of unforgiveness in your heart. Mm -hmm. Like some of us are like, I don't know what to do. And you go, okay, then what is God asking you to deal with in your heart? Let's start there. Is there someone you're bitter at? Is there some place in your life where you're not grateful? Is there some place where your idolatry is, I have to do this, and if I don't, then I'll hate God? Right. That's a great question. And start, just deal with the fork. God's going, let, take the fork out. Right. You know? We're like, no, no, I want to be the CEO of a company. He goes, let's deal with the fork of greed, because if you don't deal with that now, you may accomplish more and more and more, but eventually it comes out sideways. And we know enough headline people in the news where things come out sideways. Yep. And I think there's a lot of life stuff from you in the book, like each chapter and stuff. Like we learn things about you, uh, like you were a troublemaker as a kid. You spent a bunch of time in the principal's office, but how that principal chose uh, to deal with you actually had a profound effect on you. And the book is Finding God's Life for My Will, a little turn of phrase there from like Mike that. Donahue. Like that. <laughs> yeah, 42 trips to the principal's office my seventh grade year. We would have gotten along, you and me. <laughs> <laughs> That's, the school might have burned down. Could, did uh, your school... Uh, it was it like a Christian school? Oh, yeah. Okay, did they do spanking back then? No spankings. Oh, mine did. I'm a little older than you. Nice. And so one time I, I knew I was going to get spanked, and I put pencils in my back pocket, and she spanked me so hard she broke the pencils. So, yeah, we would have gotten along. That's a that f- is abuse, actually, when I, yeah, when I think about it up. now. <laughs> You're telling that story with a smile. I'm like, Wally. I'm like, spare the rod, man. I came out okay. We got some counselors. <laughs> so I can yeah. talk to you. Um, he caught me one time stealing candy out of the bottom of the candy machine. And uh, like literally, my, you know how I used to be able to be yeah. like, I'm sure you know. You what are you candy. doing, Mike? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. And, uh, and all he says is, man, I thought uh, 
your integrity, you're saying it's worth 50 cents. And I just, I just always thought it was worth more than that. Mm. And he just walked out. Yeah. See, that's so good. Like that's, that's that. I'm not mad at you. I'm disappointed. And you just, you can use that on your kids and it's just like wrecks them. Well, it, to me, it, 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 Equi- equivalated, equivalated, equated to the famous phrase. I think it's um, Emerson said it. But it, if you treat a man as he is, he remains that man. But treat a man as he could be and should be. You know, he'll become the better man. Yeah, I don't That's want a- to correct you. It's Seuss. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know so much. You're so learned. I know Seuss. <laughs> but it's a good lessons on labels. Instead of saying, "Okay, you're a troublemaker," and that's what you're going to be, he said. You're a child of God and yes. you're better than this yes. and you can do better than this. Yes. Okay, that's a good point, like labels, because uh, you, you talk about your behavior follows labels. Uh, which is more damaging, do you think, the labels that other people give us or the labels we give ourselves? I mean, they go hand in hand, right? But eventually, the only time it really harms you is when you believe the label someone else gives you. Right. So and yeah, the you label, internalize yeah, it the label you, you give yourself. Start to own it. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think it's it's an incredibly powerful reminder that when we label someone, we have the power to give them a new narrative to live from. You know, and that was me. He he was the first one who stopped treating me like a delinquent and said, You're better than this. Yeah. Act up. I had uh, a lunch lady at my school, Mildred Kelly. I still remember her to this day. Mildred. Yeah, Mildred Kelly. And legit, like, stereotypical lunch lady, big red beehive hairdo. Antlers. Um, amazing. She had yes. antlers, antlers right outside. Well, Mildred's yeah. such a lunch lady name. Yeah, yeah. Huh. And I was that kid that was in trouble. At my school, you had to have, if you were a guy and you had a necklace, you had to have a religious symbol on it. And so you can wear a necklace. But it had to have a religious symbol. It had symbol. to be religious. So I was rebellious. Easy. So I made a pentagram out of, a, which is a Satan symbol, yep. out of a okay. paper clip and put that on there just to push all the buttons. And so I'm about to be suspended because I won't like give in because I was that, that kid and Mildred brought me this little gold cross and she gave it to me so that I wouldn't get in trouble. And like her had her showing me that love has stayed with me all these years. I wish I, I like, I literally, it just, the necklace I had it on, I've worn it every day since then 30 something years. And the necklace I was, I wore it on just broke. And so I have it at my house. I still have it, but otherwise I could show it to you right now. Like that's, it was, that's awesome. a real Jean Valjean and the candlesticks kind of a thing. Yes. Now there's a reference I get a hundred percent. I love There we exactly. go. <laughs> Musicals, you understand. So we live in a very instant and self-gratifying culture. Uh, but in the chapter, capitalistic Christianity, you kind of flip that on its head. Yeah. Go into detail about that, because this 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 was good. Well, are we Americans first or are we part of a kingdom first? Yes, you're American. You live here, whatever. Uh, but you, you just have to... Rem- Take a step back and kind of ask yourself, is my spiritual my spirituality dictated by the kingdom's ethoses? The ethoses? Can I say ethoses? It's plural, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or or am I just following the culture I'm in? And we live and die by a capitalistic mantra, which is least amount of investment for the greatest amount of return. And when you start following Jesus, he really throws a wrench in that. Yeah, he he flipped the script on everything that everyone believed. That's what's so cool about it. Over and over, I was just reading, he's, he's got crowds of people, thousands of people, and he's like, peace, y'all, I'm going to go pray in the wilderness for a while. You know, um, he's constantly taking people aside from the crowd in Mark 7. And for me, it's just a reminder that oftentimes the the true ministerial moments that God is putting in front of us are often going to feel like a waste of time. Like I, I even go into, a, there's a chapter called The Ministry of Interruption and how most of us miss the moments that God's giving us to really minister to people because they just don't work on our timeline. Right. And they don't- I'd love to help, but- Yeah, or or for us, it's like I'm, I meet other artists and I go, am I just as mindful of the security guard as I am of, you know, you, you know, say I'm, playing a show with some other artists. The other guy that can help your career. Exactly, exactly. And uh, so just trying not to classify people and trying to get off that idea that 
this moment only matters if I'm getting this huge return on a little investment. Because if you look at God and Jesus coming to us, that was actually him making the greatest investment for the least amount of return. Right. Because he's the king of the universe. Yep. So him dying for us is like a really poor investment strategy. Yeah, especially when we squander that gift so many times or when we uh, trivialize it. You know, and and you're you're exactly right. That's why I, I thought that was a, a really huge point. And the other thing is like our transactional nature of our society. Mm -hmm. If we flip that on its head, and our transaction becomes about not winning the negotiation, that's the that's the key. So, and that's why I like when I talk about prayer in the book, I actually talk about stop using the word "I spent time in prayer" mm. or "I spent time with God." Because it's a transactional word. Right. So instead, what I say is, I wasted time with God today. <laughs> because that's what it really feels like. Right. I mean, that's what Martha says of Mary. She's wasting time here, Jesus. Do you see everything I'm doing for you? Mm -hmm. And Jesus says of Mary, who's wasting time at his feet, said she actually is choosing what's necessary. And so it just kind of helps me calm my brain down and not look at my Instagram when I'm taking some minutes to be with Jesus and go, no, I'm actually wasting time with God right now. I love in that chapter too, because you talk about how it's okay not to get it right all the time. Like sometimes when we say, okay, I'm going to go spend time with God, we expect, okay, I have 30 minutes and he's going to show up in this way. And then I'm going to write in my prayer journal and it's going to be this beautiful moment and I'm all done and it's all good to go. But that wasn't always the case for you. And you kind of had to relearn that mentality. I'd say nine times out of 10, when I take a chunk of time to be with God, and try to communicate with him, I hear nothing. I'm, I am confused. Often I'm just thinking about laundry. I'm uh, distracted. It feels jumbly. But what's weird is, and I, I quote this Henry Nouwen quote where he kind of says the same thing. Over and over, those times, they, they sort of bleed together into this flow where there's this peace in my heart. I haven't heard anything from God. Let's say it's been two weeks and I've showed up and wasted some time with God each one of those days and I didn't hear anything for two weeks. But there's this piece that comes that I go, well, at least I know that if he wanted to say something, I gave him the chance to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It goes back to what you were saying. If I haven't heard no, then I'll just keep going with what I heard last. Mm -hmm. And um, when speaking about like to your daughter trying to figure out her plan, you know, uh, there's this amazing, I say it at the end of the book, there's this amazing Frederick Beekner quote where he says, when you're trying to figure out your calling, you know, you're trying to figure out what's my big purpose in life, he says, and this is this is how I stumbled into playing music because this was not my plan. He said, and it's how I started writing a book. He says, your calling is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Mm. And a lot of us, especially those growing up in the church, they hear those those two things separately. They're those people who they only live for themselves. Those narcissists who are like, what makes me come alive? What makes me feel good? And, you know, John Eldridge even tried to sort of uh, sanctify that with Wild at Heart, like, uh, uh, you know, what makes you come fully alive? You should do that. Right. Well, it's only half the question. Because if, if you only ask, what makes me feel good? Where's my deep gladness? You just become a narcissist. But the other side is, what does the world need? The world needs missionaries. The world needs people to build wells. The world needs this. The world needs that. But if that doesn't tap into your deep gladness, then you're just going to burn out. You're just going to go and you're going to try to do all these things that you're not really suited for or wired to do. So the real beauty is when, and this is what I try to teach kids who are, and myself and adults who are like, I don't know what God's calling is. I go, okay, ask yourself those two questions. Where's your deep gladness? What makes you come alive? And how do you use that in a way that actually serves people? Mm -hmm. And that's where the fulfillment is. Well, that's interesting talking about that because there's part of this in the book where you talk about uh, it's finding God's life for my will uh, with Mike Donahue. You talk about the fact that God doesn't need you, you know, and that I know will flip people upside down because you're like, well, wait, there's a hands and feet verse and I'm supposed to do that. I'm supposed to be, how can you say that God doesn't need me? You know, and I th I'm sure that kind of messes with people. There's this beautiful moment. I get that out of Acts 17 verses 24 through 26, by the way. That's what I thought. It's actually in there. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, How many times ballpark have you read the Bible? Have you gone through the whole thing? Not recently. No, but just in your life. 
I don't. I don't know. I, you do I, know. I, I don't. You're that guy. I, I, You're that guy that knows exactly how many times you've read the Bible no, so that you can bring it up at a party think, and make me feel bad I don't about think my life. I've ever started. Your dad is over there agreeing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Wally, you wouldn't feel bad if you read the Bible more. I know, I know I'm a bad person. I do. I know I've never made it through the whole thing. And a lot of times I fall asleep when I'm praying. But this isn't about me. This is about I, Mike. You no, know, it's funny. I actually something I've been saying recently is you should you should read the Bible less to a lot of people. I am down with no, I'm just kidding. No, so what happens is we're just I gotta read to finish. And right. there's this great quote, I don't know who said it. Do you read do you read scripture to finish or do you read scripture to change? Mm. And so once I get to something that I go, mm, I got to deal with that. I just stop there. And I go, let's try to deal with that. It mm. goes back to that verse in Hebrews, today, if you hear his voice, today, today, today. So, um, 14 we're, times, yeah. roughly. Okay, so 14 times he's read the Bible, start <laughs> to finish. Pretty impressive. Uh, well, God doesn't need you. God this doesn't need you. That's what I was going to yes. say. So, the fir- so, we were a band a long time before anyone liked the music we were making, okay? So we, we were a band eight or nine years before we ever had a song on the radio or anything like that. And so we did a lot of camps, conferences, and I remember when we first started having songs on the radio and we, we get to this festival and we're there with like a bunch of people we really look up to. We're like, oh man, we get together before our set and we start doing exactly what we always do. God, use our band. God, use our band. God, use our band. God, use our band. Use our band. And God taps me on the shoulder. He's like, hey, what if I want to use the other bands? No, that's not my plan. (laughs) And I realized that even being used by God can become an idol. Oh, dude. Or or maybe a better way to say it is it becomes why you're doing it. Sure. Sure. Is you want that validation and look at the disciples. They spent so much of their time arguing over who was the best disciple. Yeah, you know? exactly. And we do the same thing in ministry. Do you think I want God to use somebody else's radio show as much as mine? No. Of course not. <laughs> exactly. The honest answer. And I gotta work on that. So I can just stop right now so, right there. So I've replaced the prayer instead of saying, God use me. Because so people are saying, Are you saying you shouldn't be used by God? No, you should be useful. Yeah. But you don't demand to be used. There's a difference. Like God. Check my heart. Am I in a useful place? Am I in a place in my heart where I'm useful? Great. Make me useful and just move. And then that way, if he uses, especially as an artist, when he's using other artists on much bigger platforms than I've ever gotten to do, suddenly I get freed up to to celebrate them instead of compete with them. Right. And now I go, God, move. Oh, you use them? Now I'm not. I'm not so, I'm just, it's still a problem. I'm not as overtaken with jealousy because I'm going, yeah, God's doing something. Well, there's freedom in that. Like, I love the quote, what if I told you your loveliness to God doesn't rise and fall with your usefulness? Because oftentimes it's back to that transactional thing. If we're saying, okay, God, use me, God, use me. And he doesn't. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait, do we have the relationship that I thought we did? And that's where I think we have issues. So as, as much as it sounds harsh, God doesn't need you. There's actually something that's very freeing in that. Yeah, and it kind of goes back to what do you really want from God? Do you want him to give you something other than himself? Like, am I obeying? Am I? Fo-? People go, oh, it's so evident that God has blessed you with a music career because you've been faithful. It's like, I don't know if that's necessarily true. The, the question I have to ask myself is, why am I being faithful? Is it so God will we'll make my blessing career me. big? Yep. Or, like, are you following God because he'll give you power in this world, or are you following God because he gives you his presence in this world? And and that's where I've really had to do a lot of soul searching and going, God, what is my greatest reward? Is it some kind of level of success, or is it some deep level of your presence in and through me? And, yeah. Uh, Do you behave and serve because you don't want to lose what he's given you or you're okay with losing everything he's given you and you'll still behave and serve? Like that's a, that's a thing for me too, inside of what I, what I do, you know, I, I wonder sometimes why am I doing this? And, and cause honestly, like I, I feel really fortunate and blessed that I get to do this every day. I'm just hoping God doesn't realize, oh, I forgot about him. <laughs> I haven't smited anyone lately, except for Becca. Uh, and like, I uh, I forgot about him and he does not deserve 
this goodness that he has in his life. We got to shake that up. Like I, I like wrestle with that, you know, yeah. it's kind of a mess. Yeah. <laughs> we're all, we're all, this always comes back to you. I think you need some therapy. There are here. certain, Mike, can you fix him? Yeah, there You've are, written a book now. There is no fixing. <laughs> some, sometimes it's just too, un, it's yeah. just too broken. There are certain people like uh, John Chris being one of them. Like he, whenever we talk, it's always about therapy and stuff like that. And there's some people and like you, you're always this deep person too. And so it always makes me feel uh, guilty, ashamed and introspective. <laughs> yeah. I need to do a better job. Be no, no, you're killing it. Depth. No. I don't want you to walk away feeling shame. I want you to walk away feeling lighter. Well, no, the shame is me. Like, that's my fault. That's my problem. But no, but no, I love these like deeper conversations uh, that we get to have with you. So one thing here, uh, there was a, a, a chapter in here where you dedicated to the perpetual yes. So how does the perpetual yes from your version differentiate itself from a self-help book about saying yes to everything and being open to every, you know, experience kind of thing? Because that's, th there's an, an, a version of that that oh, you see right. in self-help things like just say yes to every opportunity and stuff like that. I definitely don't I definitely don't, don't say just say yes to whatever you feel. Right. It's it's a say yes to what you feel like God's saying to you. And it and it kind of goes back to that fork analogy with the smoothie of going it's like I want to know God's plan for my life. Okay, forgive that person. No. Right. But I want you to give me your plan for my life. He's like then forgive that person. No. No. I want you to give me the plan and then I'll forget. And he's like, no, do what I'm asking you to do first. And we want to know 10 years from now, but we're not willing to say yes for one minute from now. So how do we think that we're going to say no to the next day and somehow we're going to be where we want to be in 10 years? Right. So it's it's more of a the, per, the perpetual yes, living, I say the living, the perpetual yes in his continual presence. Because Anytime we say no, we know that we're saying no to God, that's when the interference starts to get fuzzy. Like, why don't I hear the voice of God? Why don't I hear the voice of God? It's like, well, he, he, keeps, he keeps picking up the conversation where you left it last. And, and you, it's usually with the thing you didn't want to talk yeah, about. You, you kept telling him no about the forgiveness thing. Right. He's not going to change the channel. Right. He's like, <laughs> so, you're on this walkie-talkie trying yeah. to pick up a different signal, yeah. and you get back to channel four, and he's still yeah. going, forgive that person. You're like, no, a different channel. Yeah. Come on, God, why aren't you talking to me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, he's saying the things you just don't want to hear, so yeah. you tune him out after a while. For and that's, sure. that's the thing. When we say no to God, I, I, almost, I say something to the effect of all sinfulness starts with a no right. to God. It's like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll say yes to all these other areas, but that, no way. I usually like my litmus test for like kind of God in my life pushing me for something or whatever is, is if it costs me something or if it's completely selfless, because those are the areas that I can struggle with. I can be self-consumed. I can be a narcissist. Gosh, this is really good. <laughs> um, and, but, or if I know it's going to cost me time or money, things that I don't want to give, those are God's areas for me where he won't change that channel. He keeps coming back to it. And I have the choice to either go, you know, I, I need to bend to this. And at the times that I do, it's, it's awesome. And it's right. And you would think you would learn from that after the next time you go, that, that was really great. I should do that again. Then there's the next thing comes up and you'll still fight him on different things. And so that idea of saying yes to that thing you feel God putting on your heart as crazy as it might seem can take you to some pretty great places. It's got to be simpler than we make it. Well, yeah, we've made, we've made religion so difficult. I mean, if you look at the, the body of work, like Jewish law and things like that. And and when Jesus was uh, talking with religious leaders and what they wanted to, you know, trap him up with, and they're like, what's really important? And he's like, two things, love God and love people. If you do those, everything kind of falls into that. Just do that. You know, you know what he says in Luke chapter six? Yes. As... <laughs> Don't ask me. <laughs> what, what does he say? I'm sorry. Well, he, what does he He's say? So in Luke chapter six, there's no, 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 this. No, no, let, let him take this. What, what's in Luke chapter? You're being six? rude to our guest. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> he knows you're not going to answer. He just keeps trying. Now I'm going to quote something that's not in Luke six, yeah. just to like bait you to go. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Totally. That was Amos. I knew it. I um, knew it. No uh, one quotes Amos <laughs> in the Message version of the Bible, which you can take that or leave it. But. Um, Jesus says to the Pharisees, you think your job is to be popular. It's not. Your job is to tell the truth. Mm. And as a musician who my career 
depends on being popular. Yeah. To some that's, degree. That's really fast. That's really difficult yep. because, um, you know, we put out, you, you had me on, we talked about, it. we did an EP last year specifically for that reason. Cause you know, it's called the things we've been afraid to say. And it was all the things that I knew wouldn't sell. But I said, if I only write songs of things I know will sell, then I'm not telling the truth anymore. I'm just selling the truth. Outside of the copy that your mom and your dad bought, what do you think you sold on those? Like, did it, did it sell better that, or worse than you thought? That is one more than we actually sold. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I know. My parents stream. <laughs> yes. I remember that conversation, and I, and I, and I loved it because I do appreciate the honesty. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably not going to be like your best-selling album, you know? But I respect the fact that you do it because it, it, it can't all be about business. It, it just can't. There's this thing that I think Amy Grant said about Rich Mullins. When Rich Mullins passed away, and I don't, some of you listening probably don't know who Rich Mullins is, but um, she said at his funeral, he was the uneasy conscience of CCM. Mm, that's Something to that effect. Yeah. And uh, I just, I don't know, if I could wear any mantle with what, however long I have at this thing, I, I like the words uneasy conscience. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, because it's, it's weird that idea of being popular, because like, you and what you do, uh, we and what we do, it rests on whether people like what you are producing. And if they like it, they listen. If they don't, they don't. And the path of least resistance is easy. You just sugarcoat everything, water it down. You can make more money. Yeah, you can yeah. have more people that follow you, blah, 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 blah. And we've never wanted to do that because I just don't want to do that. Like it doesn't, that doesn't, I don't think that moves people. What, what's you know? that quote? Tr- like failure is succeeding at things that don't matter. I don't, I haven't seen that meme. I can't, but, but I want to put that in my office. That, that kind of idea, like f- yeah. true failure is if you're succeeding at something that you're not really passionate about. Right. Yeah, I agree that, with that. That would be the worst. That's worse than failing at something you're passionate about. You that's a, Yeah, see, that's the thing. And like, so to tell the truth inside of what you do can be the worst thing for your career in the Christian industry. And the best thing for your soul. Exactly. And that, and so, and that's where the faith and the trust comes in that you have to go, God, if you're telling me to tell the truth, you realize this might sting a bit for me. And what, what's even more frustrating is, you know, I'll take Phil Wickham, for example. I love Phil Wickham. Phil Wickham is one of the sweetest, most impossibly nice humans I've ever met. With the highest male voice. Yeah, it's very high. It's, it's almost it's high. almost female. It's, <laughs> yeah. Well, you heard yourself sing? Yes! Uh, <laughs> yeah. But he, the tension is God doesn't call everyone to the same thing. It's, so it's easy for me to look at Phil and he's just writing all these beautiful songs for the church and he's and he's like experiencing incredible success and i don't feel like he's not doing what god's asking him to do right he's not selling out so it's right. it's easy to measure oh well therefore i need to do whatever i can do to match phil's success instead of going like when our label came to us and said we really need you to cover this popular worship song and for a lot of artists that was probably the right thing Right. For me, I had to search my soul and go, I think I think I want to write songs about people and their shame. And I kind They of, went, that doesn't <laughs> sell. Well, I mean, and, Does your but, kid need braces? Because you might want to do this worship song but we, thing. But we doubled down on it. And yeah. our, our next record's called No Shame, you know, for that reason. Nice. And I think we just, we're just going, what are, what are we uniquely, where's my unique deep gladness and where I see a need in the world, and how can those two things coincide? And that's success. And it goes back to the book. You know, if everyone's you know everyone's covering that same worship song, they might be like, "Well, that's God's will. That's God's will. That's God's will for my life." So we're going to do that. But that's not the obedience that you feel that you're called to, and that's the difference. So this is what I've realized: we're not really scared of what God would ask us to do unless he asks us to do something that doesn't give us the power and success that we were hoping for. And the hardest thing is when he calls someone to do something else that is just naturally going to give them more success and more power than you. So it's easy to disqualify what God is asking you to do based upon what the end result is going to be. And that's why I was talking about capitalistic Christianity is I can't listen to the voice of God and go, okay, is that going to satisfy all my idols? I have to go, 
is listening to what God's asking me to do enough, you know, mm. and not put up what my level of success is against someone else's to qualify if that was what God was asking me to do or not. Oh, absolutely. I, the, the Lord made Bobby Bones more successful than me for a reason. It's to teach me a lesson about humility. Dude, and you know, my wife, she's been so good she for me. She to Bobby Bones, doesn't she? She, uh, she loves Bobby Bones. Dang it. She was cheering for him on Dancing with <laughs> the Stars. You need to work oh, on this. Yeah, on she was that. all yeah. about oh. some Bobby yeah. Bones. He's on Family Feud with his family. What's he ever done? Yeah, anyway, it's fine. It's another fine. story. But the, the point of it is, is I constantly fall into the comparison trap of other artists and I'll I'll start bemoaning, ah, what happened? You know, they started after our band. Right. We had more number one singles, and yet they're making ten times more money than I am, you know? And and my wife always is the first to go, or thank you, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't you hate that when like, they're right? Like, like that? Like, do you want that? Is that yeah. really what you want? Because I think we have a pretty great life. Because a lot of stuff that you're not seeing that she sees that that comes with that, the the time away from family and those choices that you have to make, for her, it's more valuable to have you around, believe it or not, and uh, than it is to have you uh, making more money in the bank. Like, our wives are so good at understanding that. My wife's always there's, got that. There's this incredible prayer I, I put in the book. I feel like it's the most unutilized prayer of the Bible in America. It's in Proverbs 30. And King Agar, and he's a king. I mean, he's got everything, but he prays, God, don't let me become poor. Like, okay, I like that part. <laughs> yeah. Lest I Check. curse you. Also, do not let me become rich, lest I forget you. Oh, that's cool. And I just don't hear a lot of people praying that. And what's interesting, Malcolm Gladwell in his book, David and Goliath, he talks about wealth and happiness as a you graph. And we expect wealth and happiness to do this, right? Like right. more money you make than statistically the happier you get. But in huge, uh, huge polls that they've done all this research, researchers are coming back and saying, no, it's actually this U graph where, yeah, if you have zero money, you actually register very low in happiness. And then it goes up to about seventy to $100,000 a year. And then when you start making more than that, statistically, right. there's exceptions to every rule. But statistically, happiness goes back down. And it's just this interesting thing of going, there really is this sweet spot. And what I'm trying to argue for in the book is there's this sweet spot of like knowing what the next step is. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. In the book of Isaiah, it says, you'll hear a voice right behind you, whether you turn to the left or to the right, say, go this way. There's this sweetness when I am hearing from God, but it's like the next step. And I'm still dependent on hearing him, like I'm saying with the friend in the passenger seat. I have to like, okay, now what? Now where are we going? Now where are we going? And we're going, no, give me 10 steps ahead. And God's going, if I gave you that many riches, if I gave you that many steps, maybe you would forget to listen to me. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I know, I know like so many people, myself included, when things are great, you know, you're like, okay, God, I kind of got this now. I'm going to take over. And then when it gets bad, you're like falling on your face, bemoaning, why hast thou forsaken me, O Lord? It's like, I was here the whole time. And like for music, I related to this, and you probably feel this way doing your show. Like there's a sweet spot in the middle of a tour when you feel really rehearsed yeah. and you really know what you're doing, but you still don't quite know how it's going to go. And you're sort of like, you're a little, but then by the end of the tour, a lot of times what you'll find is you're just, did we just play five songs? Yeah, you, you blink so, and you miss it. You're yeah. so locked in. So there's this sweetness of you're prepared, you 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 know what you're meant to do, but but this like alive electricity that happens when but I don't exactly know how it's gonna go. Yeah, and with our lives, that's terrifying a lot of times, oh. but it's healthy. So here's the deal. Uh, we've talked about a lot of concepts uh, from the book, Finding God's Life for My Will, Mike Donahue from 10th Avenue North. So... A lot of great concepts, a lot of great truths. We learned that you read the Bible 47 times. Uh, <laughs> I went out. to the principal's office 47, 42 times. Got it. Uh, yeah. So what is like the big, like if you could encapsulate this down, because we're a nugget society, what is like one big takeaway? You're like, okay, I want someone to get this out of this book. Aye, aye, aye. I know. It's a big concept. God, and I got a lot. No, God doesn't need your success. He wants your surrender. That has the proper amount of alliteration in it too, yeah, which yeah, is good. Exactly. <laughs> um, I like that. No, it's good. That's a great. That's a great point. The other way I would say it is, we're not 
living for validation, but from it. There you go. I like that. I, uh, I don't need to change. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to <laughs> It's a 10 pack of nuggets. Yeah, he's gonna... <laughs> it's not one nugget. <laughs> I don't need to change God's mind about my life. I need to let him change my mind with his. There you go. You got one more in you? I think that's all. <laughs> I, I could do this all day. Out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>